So I wanted to put out a recipe for a really simple and effective sourdough bread. I am by no means any sort of expert on the subject, but I am able to knock up a loaf or two with relative success from time to time. Obviously, with the current situation, there are more of us baking at home and loads of people trying sourdough for the first time, which I think is fantastic. Unfortunately, I've seen lots of recipes and sort of beginner's guides to sourdough bread, which I just don't think are that helpful for people who are trying sourdough for the first time. To be honest, I think they're asking too much of first time bakers with high hydrations and tricky kneading techniques. So I thought I'd share my no need sourdough recipe that has no complicated processes or tricky techniques that you need to master. I mean, this should allow you just to get that sort of first sourdough loaf under your belt and then from there you can just start scaling up the skill level. You don't need to be a professional baker to get this dough done, it doesn't require any kneading, there's no slap and fold, there's no stretch and fold, there's no window pane test. We want a successful loaf without getting twisted and turned and confused by all these tricky techniques which personally I think when you're starting out you don't really need to worry about. Right now that's all out of the way, let's go and make some sourdough. So before we begin, I'm going to assume that you have a sourdough starter that is alive and kicking. Mine's called Audrey, but naming your starter is not required for this recipe. What is important to note is that Audrey is 100% hydration, which means for every one gram of flour, there is one gram of water. This may seem like an unnecessary insight, but this information will allow us to know how much water to add to our dough later on. So take your active sourdough starter and add 100 grams of it to a large mixing bowl. Then add 450 grams of strong white flour. This is just off the shelf supermarket own brand bread flour. Not some sort of special artisan stone ground thing, just the run of the mill bog standard bread flour. You don't need super fancy ingredients to make a good loaf of bread. Then add 14 grams of mold and sea salt. If this seems like too much for you, feel free to take it down a couple of grams, but for me, this is just the right amount. Then we're gonna add 290 ml of room temperature water. This, along with the water in my starter, is gonna bring the total amount of water in the dough to 340 grams. As I mentioned, my starter is 100% hydration, which means for every gram of flour, there is a gram of water. So the 100 grams of starter in our dough equates to 50 grams of flour and 50 grams of water. This means the totals in our dough are 500 grams of flour and 340 grams of water, which is 68% hydration. Personally, I think this is a really good place to start. It's not too wet to handle if you're just starting out, but also not too dry that you end up with a really dense, tough dough. This is just my personal opinion. If you think you've nailed this dough, then you can start upping that hydration. But if you wanna be some sort of hero right off the bat, then feel free to add more water straight away. Now, using a dough scraper or your hand, start bringing everything together. We're not trying to make a smooth ball of dough at this stage, we just wanna mix the flour and water together. Basically until there's no more dry bits on the bottom of the bowl and it forms into a very rough looking dough. Once it's come together, we're gonna to cover the dough and leave it to rest or autolise for an hour. Now, autolies is just a fancy term for letting the dough sit there and do nothing. Literally, you don't have to do anything. Go make a cup of coffee, go read a book, watch some TV. There's literally nothing to do. Autolies in your dough does many interesting science things that I'm not going to get into right now. But to give you a summary, it allows the flour to fully hydrate, allows the gluten to develop, magic happens, and then this results in a dough that's easier to work with, easier to shape, and a loaf that's got a better texture, rise, and flavor. So just let it do its thing for an hour, okay? Once the dough is rested, we're gonna shape it up, ready for the bulk proof. We wanna use all that gluten that's developed to help keep in as much air in the dough as possible, so we're just gonna give this a little structure. So all we're gonna do is drag the dough towards ourselves. It's as if we were dragging our chips in from a winning poker hand. This is the best analogy I can think of. So we are going to drag our dough towards ourselves with our little fingers flush to the board and then turn the dough 90 degrees, basically from three o'clock to 12 o'clock. And I don't really know how else to say it. So turn the dough and then repeat dragging it towards ourselves. Basically, if you can do this, you're gonna have no problem with shaping this dough. Turn the dough out onto the work surface. You'll notice that the texture of this dough has changed quite a bit since we left it to rest. It should feel a little bit firmer, should have a bit more elasticity to it. Make sure not to add any flour at this stage though, because it will be a bit sticky, but we're gonna use that stickiness to help create the tension in this dough. Fold the edges of the dough into the center and then using your dough scraper, loosen the dough from the board and flip it over. Then we can begin dragging the dough towards ourselves, giving it a turn and then repeating this process of dragging and turning, literally a couple of turns and you can already see the difference in this dough from that rough mess that we brought together a little over an hour ago. This just goes to show how much gluten develops during that autolyse stage. No kneading necessary, incredible. Now, once you have this beautiful smooth ball of dough, you can place it back into the bowl cover it and now it's time to leave it to ferment or bolt proof. 
This is really just a dose of first rice where we let the yeast get to work. It starts developing that flavor, getting gas into the dough. The amount of time you wanna leave your dough will completely depend on your circumstances. I would recommend no less than five hours in a reasonably warm place, like between 20 to 25 degrees. I filmed this towards the end of the date, so I'm gonna leave mine out overnight for about 12 hours. The house drops down to about sort of 14 to 15 degrees downstairs, and I know through experience that this will work well for me. But you can play around with the times. You can always put the dough in the fridge overnight if you have a particularly warm kitchen. So let's say five to 12 hours for your bulk ferment, and you can play around with that window. And now it's the next day for me and there's definitely been some activity overnight. Don't expect this to double in size, but you should be able to see some signs of life in the dough. You can see all those little air pockets in this beautifully framed shot that I've managed to put together. The bolt proof is over, so we are going to shape our dough. There are two stages to this, the pre-shape and the final shape, which basically means we shape out twice. This is gonna help create and retain as much tension in our dough as possible. So lightly flour your work surface. Now sourdough purists might say not to, but I don't care. It makes shaping a little bit easier and it affects the dough about this much in my opinion. Just don't go crazy, you can see how much I'm using here. Carefully turn your dough out onto the surface, smooth side down, being careful not to degas the dough and lose all those tiny little air pockets we spent hours waiting for. Then all we're gonna do is gently fold the edges of the dough into the middle, pressing down gently to seal them together. So fill the top edge of the dough over and into the middle of the dough and lightly press down to seal it in place. Give the dough a quarter turn and then press it down again. Turn the dough once more and repeat this folding and pressing. Then finally, give the dough one more turn and press it into the middle, but this time continue to roll up the dough into a kind of log shape. Then, yes, we're still going, turn the dough again, flip it over so the seam is facing up and then we're gonna fold the top edge of the dough into the middle, pressing down with our thumbs to seal it, and then continue to roll and press the dough right down to the bottom. Give the dough another quarter turn and then start dragging it towards you just like we did when we shaped it for the bulk ferment. Repeat this process of turning and dragging the dough several times to get a smooth ball of dough. Then cover and leave the dough for 20 to 30 minutes just to allow the gluten to relax before we give this dough its final shape. Once the pre-shaped dough is rested, we're gonna repeat that shaping process one last time. Folding the edges into the middle, pushing down with our thumbs to seal and create that tension. Finishing it with the drag and turn technique to really tighten this dough. Let's look at it from above and see that technique one last time. Place the dough smooth side down, being careful not to lose any air from the dough. Fold the top edge of the dough over into the middle of the dough and lightly press down to hold it in place. Then give the dough a quarter turn, Fold and press down again to seal it. Turn the dough again, repeat this folding and pressing. Then finally, give the dough one more turn, press it into the middle, but this time continue to roll up the dough into a kind of log. Flip it over so the seam is facing up and fold the top edge of the dough into the middle, pressing down with our thumbs to seal it and continue to roll and press the dough right down to the bottom. Quarter turn the dough one more time and then start that dragging and turning technique. Repeat this until the dough is tight and smooth. This is where you're gonna get all that great spring when you bake it in the oven later. Now you can transfer your shaped dough into a banneton. I have this cloth lined one that I've dusted with a little bit of rye flour just to stop the dough from sticking. And I also dust the dough with a little bit just for luck. Carefully place the dough into the proving basket, smooth side down. Now all that's left to do is to leave it to prove in a warm place for a few hours. I usually do somewhere between three and five hours, depending on what suits me. My kitchen was about 24, 25 degrees when I got to this stage, so I left them for about three hours. So cover with a cloth and let it do its thing. But what do you do if you don't have a fancy proving basket or even a cheap one like mine? Well, a tea towel dusted and rubbed with a little bit of rye flour and a bowl will do the job and no problem. Just use it as you would the proving basket or a banneton, cover it and leave the dough to proof. Now, when it comes to cooking my sourdough, I always do it in a Dutch oven, which is basically preheating a cast iron pot like this one without the lid at 250 degrees or as high as your oven can go. Then I place the dough inside, cover with the lid and bake it. For me personally, this gives the best result for my bread as it sort of imitates the baker's oven. Use the water from the bread to create steam inside the pot, which slows down the crust development during the cooking, which gives my dough a much better spring and rise during the baking. If you don't have a pot like this, you can always use a baking stone and a hot tray to create some steam. Now, I don't have a baking stone, but I have used something thick and heavy like this grill pan to act like a stone surface, while using a frying pan with baking beans underneath it to create the steam. 
I place the frying pan in the bottom of the oven with the grill pan on the shelf above upside down so it's a flat surface and preheat it for about an hour at 250 degrees or as high as your oven will go. Then I slide my bread onto the grill pan acting as the breadstone and pour a kettle full of boiling water onto those baking beans in the frying pan to create a whole heap of steam. Now just be careful if you try this at home, steam is hot so be careful. Then I shut the door and I let my loaves bake. Unfortunately, I guess my oven seal isn't that great because I lose a lot of steam and then the loaf never turns out quite the way I'd like it. Um, but you'll figure out what works best for you in your kitchen. Now, before we finish, we need a peel for our bread. Now, I don't have one. Did I mention I'm not a professional baker? So I like to use the base of a tart tin. It works just fine. I also need something to score the dough with, so I'm freehanding with this razor, but you can buy alarm uh, to make yourself a little bit more professional. I'm kind of MacGyvering my sourdough setup here. Right, back to the bread. So our dough is at its final proof and we can see that it hasn't doubled in size but there's definitely some activity. Uh, don't expect it to look like dough that you've made with commercial yeast. It should bounce back when it's pressed which is a great sign that there's definitely still tension in the dough which means it should, and I mean should, spring open when it's baked. So carefully turn the dough out onto your peel, dust off any excess flour, I like to rub it in just to even out a little bit. And now before we score it, don't go there just yet, we need to remove our preheated pot from the oven. Remember 250 degrees for at least an hour. So this thing is gonna be screaming hot, so be careful. Then we can score our bread. I like to keep it simple, one long cut right down the middle. Then carefully use the peel to slide the dough into the pan, cover with a lid, and then return to the oven and bake at 250 degrees for about 35 minutes or so. After 35 minutes, the dough should have risen up and started to go a light golden brown color. You can see how much this loaf has sprung open once I start fucking about with the exposure. Remove the lid and return the pan to the oven for another 10, 15 minutes or until you are happy with how golden brown your bread is. You can go as dark as you like. Once cooked, turn the sourdough out of the pan and place it on a wire rack to cool. And that is it. We've made a sourdough loaf. Now, is it the most perfect loaf there ever was? Hell no. In fact, I'm a little bit disappointed with the cracks here because I think they've affected that sort of final spring and it's sod's law that that would happen when I'm filming. But I think it's important that you see that not every bake is going to be perfect. It definitely doesn't mean it was a failure. I think it's risen beautifully. I think it has a really nice ear on top, which I know people love to get when they're making their sourdough. The structure inside is great. I think there's a really good balance of good sized air pockets and denser areas. Of course, if you like a more open structure that is bigger holes in your finished bread, then you can up the hydration and you should see that start to happen. Now, if you don't mind, I'm gonna have a little taste. just gonna be a quick sourdough video and then I just wouldn't shut up so if you made it this far well done let me know in the comments now if you're just starting out with sourdough then I think this loaf is a really good place to begin there's no tricky techniques to learn or uh, wet dough to mess around with what it does require is time now this loaf took about 20 hours from start to finish but you can cut that down depending on your circumstances and what suits you for me, I'm trying to fit this around the family, so that works quite well for me. But time is really what you've got to be willing to invest if you want the best results from your sourdough. Once you feel you've mastered this sourdough recipe, you can start scaling up the skill level. Try different flour combinations. This dough was a 68% hydration, so you can increase the water content, take it to 70, 75, 80, you get the idea. Now, before you go, don't forget, with bread, we are always learning. Now, there's people who've been baking for 30 years who will tell you the exact same thing. And I think that's the beauty of it. Whether we're baking bread or cooking in general, we never stop learning, which can only mean we're always getting better. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you like this recipe, let me know by hitting the thumbs up down below. And if you're new here and you like what you see, why not consider subscribing as well? Reach out to me on Instagram or Facebook. I love to see what you guys are cooking. I will see you next time. Thank you.